Hi, everyone. This is Michael Hoffman at C3. I'm really excited to have you. Uh, some folks are just coming in right now, but, uh, but we're going to get started uh, with the webinar. The webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to listen to it later. People who are not able to attend can listen to it, and you'll be able to share the recording uh, with others. Um, also with me today is Bridget Colling. Bridget is my partner in crime here in C3 content world. Um, and Bridget's going to help uh, run the webinar uh, and, and manage. We're going to do a couple of polls um, so I can know a little bit about you and what your needs are. So um, let's get started. Uh, you can also, if you have questions, you can put them into the chat uh, window. Um, uh, and uh, Bridget will be watching that as I'm doing the webinar. So welcome to Show Your Story, How to Make a Great Gala Event Video. Um, this is me. Uh, I, uh, there's my email, my Twitter handle, and my phone number. So you should feel free to reach out um, uh, with questions, comments, um, uh, and anything you need. You know, this is a topic that we live and breathe every day here at C3, and there's a lot that we could talk about. So I'm making some choices about the things that I think are the kind of big picture things, the highest value things. But there's certainly things we're not going to cover or not cover in depth. Um, if you have questions, again, feel free to um, reach out. Um, and everybody who's registered will get an email that has afterwards with uh, with the uh, link to the webinar recording and um, you can also uh, contact me just by going to c3.com um, so a little about us we work we're a uh, we're the digital agency for do-gooders we work with nonprofits and social causes and our job is to activate people to change the world um, so sometimes that means fundraising sometimes advocacy awareness recruitment um, and sometimes all of the above um, and we work with clients that um, uh, there's probably some of you on the phone welcome uh, on the webinar here uh, and uh, so some of our clients are, are, are sort of brand names in the nonprofit world and uh, we also work with community organizations and, and, and lots of different kinds of folks so um, we're really glad that you're here so I'm going to turn it over to Bridget and we're going to just take a couple of quick polls so I can get a sense of your where you stand now in this whole question of the event videos all right hi everyone so we have three polls for you today I'm going to launch the first one in just a second this poll are you planning to produce a gala event video in 2015 here we go seeing a lot of yeses coming in a few no's so some people getting probably prepped for next year or just want to gain that knowledge all right See, about 90% are voted. I'm going to close the poll. So I'll show you these results here so we can see almost 80% of you are planning to produce a gala event video later this year. And our next question, what is your budget for your upcoming gala event video? I'm going to launch this. So see some of these votes coming in at about 50%. All right, getting closer to 90%. I'm going to close the poll shortly, so please get your votes in. Okay, and our results from that poll. So we see a lot of people who are less than 10K, um, and then some people who are in that 11 to 25, and then a few who are in um, that higher 26 to 15. All right, and that question is helpful for us, so we know, um, you know it, it really depending on what your budget is, the kind of video you can create varies greatly. Um, so it's good to know that before we get into the details here. And then our last question, um, are you planning on producing other videos in 2015, aside from a gala event video? Seeing a lot of yeses, which we love to see. All right, got about 90% of votes in. Going to close the poll shortly, so get your last couple of votes in there. All right, so we see lots of people are planning to create not only a gala event video, uh, but additional videos as well within the 2015 years. So that's great to see. 
That's terrific. So over 80% of you are doing more than the event video. I think that's great. When we started this work 10 years ago, um, I would say that question would have been answered very differently, that if there were any videos happening, they were that Gala event video, and that was it. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that there wasn't a lot of opportunity to distribute video 10 years ago uh, in terms of people's bandwidth, and, and the web was not what it is today. Um, and so we're in a new world where your video strategy is not one video. It's about how you consistently create compelling content. Um, and the gala event video is a subset of that. And so let's dive in here. Um, so let's talk about, let's start with just talking about what's wrong with a lot of gala event videos. I attend um, a fair number of gala events. I see many, many gala event videos, even if I don't attend the events because um, that's part of my job. Uh, and often um, uh, those videos elicit a, a bit of a groan. So one problem is that some of these videos are just incredibly boring. So a little bit like watching paint dry. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what, why that is. But I think you know, w one important thing is that you are not your audience. So the things that might be interesting to you may not be interesting to your audience. And so really thinking everything we do at C3 is audience-centric, constituent-centric, donor-centric. So really thinking about how do they see things? What are they interested in? Let's know that before we go into a project. <clears throat> Let's not make things that are going to be boring. Second thing is that there's a lot of Gala event videos that are just too long. Attention spans are reducing, <laughs> are being reduced. Um, and we see that, you know, all over, right? We see that. I mean, I remember when I first heard about Vine videos, six second videos, you think, oh my God, what could you possibly do in six seconds, right? This is the world we live in today. It is a, a, it doesn't mean that people won't watch long form content. We also see a kind of renaissance of, of television and long form content as well. But um, if you can't keep people interested and get them interested very quickly and keep their interest. So the answer to how long a video should be is really how, is, as long as it needs to be and not a second longer. Um, but organizations often think it needs to be longer. And we'll get into some of those details of why. The next thing that we see very common in Gale event videos is of videos that are overly detailed, you know, telling all kinds of details about programs. Um, and I will, we will talk about this more, but um, that's not what people care about. So as you get into all the kinds of strategies you're doing and all the program details, um, that is not what's going to hold your audience's attention. So, and then one final one I'll throw in here, which is, um, poor production uh, values. So, you know, in, in many kinds of web content today and video content today, you don't need to have uh, production values that are really high production values. Often in gala events, it's really a different story because you're setting a certain tone um, about the organization. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to spend outrageous amounts of money, but it does mean that things have to be done well. So a very common production thing I see is a, uh, an interview that's done with, a, with some kind of camera, but there's no external microphone. The person's not wearing a, a lavalier mic or there's not some, some di directional mic that's picking up the sound, so it feels kind of hollow. You feel like you're sort of far away from the speaker. Those kind of things are not expensive things to fix. It's just a question of that production value. So, so these are some of the very common problems of Gale event videos. And so let's talk about a little bit about how we can do better, because we can do better. And the great news is that it's getting easier to do better. There's lots of examples of what better looks like. Um, and so I think if you're part of that majority here on this webinar who are, are undertaking making a gala event video, I think really setting a high bar is, uh, is good and saying we can do better, we can do better than we've done, we can do better than certainly better than average. So we really want to kind of hit the reset button here um, on this on, on your project on making Gale event videos. 
And I think where we really need to start um, is goals. So what do you want your video to do? And this is, I think, where there's not a lot of, not certainly not enough deliberate discussion about what this video is designed to accomplish. And so you really need to think about what that video is for and how does that video fit into your event and into your larger communication strategy. So an example there is I, I see a video uh, or, or we're talking to somebody about making a video and they say, well, we want to talk about this program and this program and this program and this program. And I'll say, well, is the purpose of the video in the event to tell people about your programs? Right? It's kind of a simple question. Well, often what we learn when we start to dig in and really think strategically with, with, with the organization we partner with is that the best thing of this Gale event video could do is set an emotional foundation for deeper connection to the organization. Right? So all of a sudden that, that we got to tell you about our programs, well, we're going to solve that in a different way. The, the, um, the executive director is going to speak for a little bit. There's going to be something on the table, a leave behind that has some uh, statistics and, a, and an infographic about our programs. We're solving that a different way. The video doesn't have to carry all that water. That's not the job of the video. So really thinking seriously, what is the job of that video will set the tone of your project. So, so you can keep referring back to those goals and saying, are we doing this? What story, if the video is all about emotions, which emotions, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but then the question becomes then what story will drive that goal? Um, and then also how does the video fit into your event? A legitimate goal of a, one legitimate goal of a Gala event video is to keep droning on talking heads off the stage, right? So you say there's certain people that we have to hear from because for political reasons, for whatever reasons, um, and we're going to have, we're going to do some interviews with those people. We're going to take clips of those interviews. They're going to, they're going to, we have to have, make sure that those find their way into our video. Um, and then that's, we've done our part to have those voices involved in this event, which allows us, opens up, frees up uh, things that we can do in the event. So that, so those are all legitimate things. I think the the problem comes when you don't articulate those things, when you don't have organizational buy-in, when different people start to have different ideas about what the goals are. Often, the Gala event video is seen almost like an organizational homepage. It's like that one space, and everybody wants a piece of it. Every program, everything. Well, you got to talk about this. You got to have, you know, this, 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 and this. And that's a recipe for boring too long, all of the things that we just talked about. So again, this is probably the most important thing is really just setting the tone internally as your project with your production partner if you have one and saying, well, what are we trying to do here? How do we know that we've done it? What's that strategy? Um, again, if you have questions, you can put them into the chat window um, and uh, I will we'll have hopefully have some time for questions at the end. And then also Bridget um, has free reign to interrupt me uh, any time to, to uh, ask questions that we have. Well, so let's go back to that emotion thing. So can I interrupt you, Michael? Video is... Hello? Bridget? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Cool. Are you fine? Great. Um, so I'm going to interrupt you the question. Uh, we had okay. Eleanor ask. Um, she said that she sees the... The Nevin model is still very much in use, which mandates a seven-minute video, and that feels unnaturally long. Um, so do you have any response for folks who are wedded to that particular model? Yeah, I just don't think that the idea that there's some length that you have to have is just not right at all. I mean, to me, today, with the way people have been trained to have short attention spans, seven minutes is a very long time. I'm not saying that seven minutes is um, is always wrong, um, but you have to have a lot of really interesting stories to tell, things to say, to make seven minutes make any sense at all. So, you know, I think we increasingly, I would say 10 years ago, that's where we were on average, and I say where we are today is more in that 
four minute range, you know, somewhere between three and five we're seeing. Um, and it's because you want to leave people excited. You want to, again, elicit certain emotions. Uh, you don't want them to go, uh, you don't even want a second of, you want them to, the video to be done and them wish it was longer. You don't want them to go, oh, that could have ended like three minutes ago. You don't want that feeling at all, right? You'd rather have them want more because that's, how do you get the more? You get the more through your engagement with this organization. So again, I think it's wrong to put those kind of firm things on it. I think you have to drive it from your goals and drive it from the stories you have available. Um, and it's much harder to make shorter video than longer video, right? Longer video is easy. You just keep everything in, right? Shorter video is saying, we got to make some hard choices. Let's be really rigorous about that. Um, so that is, you know, how we approach it. So going back to the um, emotions, um, video is really good at eliciting emotions. And so when you have a video that just talks about your program, that's kind of just conveying information, well, you can convey information sometimes much better, uh, certain information better in a written document, in a, in a little book that's on the tables um, with somebody talking about it. So use video for what video is good at. Video is good at visual stories um, uh, and storytelling and emotional storytelling. So what kind of emotions do you want people to um, experience? And so I want to talk a little bit about emotions. This is something that comes from the, um, uh, a guy who's at the Kennedy School at Harvard, Marshall Gans, who was, a, who was an organizer um, uh, and developed a story framework which I'm not going to go too into, but they're really not all emotions are the same. And there's emotions that that lead to stagnation that keep people from acting and doing things. And there's emotions that motivate people. And so, you know, so you can see here that some of those emotions um, uh, that motivate people are things like urgency, like why do we have to do something now? So um, it is important, right? Because your issue has probably been going on for a long time and will probably continue to go on for a long time. But what is it about this moment that matters? I think the most important one is this last one, YCMAD. And that stands for you can make a difference. And that's really important because the feeling that you can make a difference is absolutely critical to fundraising, right? This is something that smart fundraisers know is if you tell me a story or you show me something that looks too big for me to manage, I'm gonna opt out of that because I look at that and I say, wow, that is a problem. But my little donation, even my moderate donation, even my big donation, I can't solve that, right? And that's why we know from lots of psychological testing, for example, that when you tell the story of one person and their needs and how they're solved, you get better results than when you say things like, you know, a million children have AIDS or something. Because when you present stories that way, when you use statistics in that way, it often, the, the subtle message there is that no matter how much money you can give, you can't actually do anything about this. So thinking about that is really important. You have folks who are connected to your organization, they've come to your event, they've been asked by other people to come to the event, right? So you have varying degrees of connection. Um, and you want them to feel like more than anything else they could do, this is the place where they could make a difference. So I think that just by asking that question and saying, what story would we tell? What would we know? What would we do that would bring out that feeling um, and, and other feelings that motivate people is an important conversation to have. So another item that is really critical here is the idea of just giving yourself enough time to do a job. So we, you know, we do crazy heroic things in making videos at C3. We don't love that. You know, we love when people have the time to really be strategic and think, and then also to be able to get the footage that you need to be able to gather the information and material you need to be able to do a thoughtful editing thing, to be able to get uh, somebody to create custom music, for example, right? To be able to craft something that's going to be very powerful. And generally, you know, the uh, you know somewhere in the four-month time frame is great. 
um, three months you can do, two months you start getting into fire drill, you know, a few weeks, you it's crazy town, right? So um, really looking ahead, you know when your event is a long time in advance, right? You book those those ballrooms, you you start thinking and planning way in advance. The video should be on that agenda early on. You should be thinking about it as early as possible. And I would really say there's no too early to start. And the reason there's no too early to start is often you have opportunities to collect footage during the year that you, as, so you might have an event six months before your gala uh, that if you had thought about it, you would have captured certain people and do an interview there, capture the event that's going to make its way into that gala event video. If you started that gala event video only three months before the event, then you can't go backwards, right? You don't have that same opportunity. And sometimes those visuals, that video you could have captured at other times is more compelling, right? Because it's more active. It's not just a setup kind of interview or other things like that. So again, just giving yourself some more time. Another thing that is critical is looking at what other people are doing. So a great way to do that is through the Daily Do-Gooder. If you're not familiar with it, dailydogooder.com. It's a website where we curate the best of nonprofit video. Um, and there's hundreds, maybe, yeah, hundreds and hundreds of videos on there. It's all organized by type, by type of organization, by type of videos. So you can look up all kinds of things. Just watch some stuff that other people have. If you're working in a committee in your organization, start to ask keepers, hey, here's three videos. Who do you like? Why do you like it? Um, and start to understand you know, what resonates for people. And I think if you can do that with some major donors, for example, that's a great thing too because that, that's much more your audience than, than those internal stakeholders. But, but really looking at what other people are do, doing, there's some great innovation, there's things. And what you'll come to find is the things that we're talking about here, the people who talk lots of detail about their programs, you as an outsider are like, that's not so interesting to me. Um, people who tell really compelling stories about one person or one family or one event or one circumstance, you're going to feel much more strongly about. Uh, so, and that's also a way to then go back to those stakeholders and draw the line about how you're doing this production. You say, well, these are the things you said that you liked, so that's why we're doing it this way, right? When somebody says, well, why aren't you putting in this information or that thing? So again, helping you manage those internal stakeholders is something we're very practiced at at C3. Because again, it's not, just make, it's not just about making the video, it's about making the right video that achieves uh, impact. And, and you know, C3, that's what we're all about, all about impact. So just to, to harp on this a little bit more, you know, program details are probably the least interesting thing about you. Um, people care about people. Um, and so the, the, all of the way in which you, you do things um, can sound a lot like a lot of inside baseball to people who are, who are your audience and can take away from the emotional goals that those video has, that the video has. And so, um, uh, you know, really the, um, the uh, you know, again, program details just are not the part of what you're doing that's interesting. Um, and, you know, I think about it like this. I think about who's doing the work on the ground in your organization, who's working with your clients or working on the change on the ground. And what are the things that go home at night and tell their spouse or their friend over drink, you wouldn't believe this thing I just saw today, or you, I want to tell you about this person, this amazing person I met, right? Like that's where the level where the real stories are and finding a connection. One of the challenges we often have is that the comms people, the fundraising team is sometimes removed from the action that is surfacing those stories. Um, and so really trying to make that connection, trying to reach out to those key people and saying, hey, your job's really important for helping us find those stories and, and doing some work in advance and not just assuming you know what those stories are, but having enough time to go out and say, hey, what story is the most resonant, resonant stories for you and why? And second thing 
taking that and, and, and making that more of something where there's a lot more organizational buy-in. So I want to give you one um, story framework that I think is the most important one. And if you've ever heard me speak before pretty much about anything, this is something I talk a lot about. I've been talking about for a long time because I think it's really the most powerful um, framework. And if you know about it, you know that already. If you don't know about it, it may change how you see stories in general and, and how you tell stories. And it's called the hero's journey. And the hero's journey um, is something that comes from a guy named Joseph Campbell, who was an academic, um, I think he was at St. Lawrence College, uh, and he did studies of comparable uh, studies around myths. That was his thing, around stories of our culture and myths, and he looked at myths all over the world. He looked at foundational stories of cultures all over the world, and he discovered a pattern. He discovered this pattern that was in stories all over the world um, are really foundational stories that, that people kept telling. And he saw this pattern and he said, wow, this is amazing that all of these stories follow the pattern. So the pattern is the hero's journey. It starts at the top in the ordinary world. So there's a person, the hero, they're in the ordinary world. And then something happens. There's some kind of call to adventure. So one, one area that he looked at was religion. So you think about call to adventure, you think about um, Moses, you know, the, the burning bush is calling Moses to adventure. Something happens that changes, right? Often the hero refuses the call, says, I'm not the guy you're looking for, um, or I'm not the woman you're looking for because I'm just a regular person. Um, so often they refuse this call initially. And then there's a mentor. The mentor is the one who says to them, no, you can do it. You are that person that we think you are. You're not just an ordinary person. You're extraordinary. And I am going to show you how to do that. I'm going to coach you. I'm going to be your mentor. I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, so there's always the mentor. The mentor is really important. Crossing the threshold is simply you've gone too far. You've seen too much. You can't go back to your regular life. Um, your, your, your life's in danger, whatever it is. You can't go back anymore. You always have test allies and enemies. The innermost cave is that moment that the hero goes through of self-doubt, of I can't do this. It's too big. It's too hard. It's impossible. I'm going to fail. Um, and that's very common in all of these stories. They go through some ordeal. There's some reward um, going through that ordeal. And then they go back to the ordinary world, but they don't go back the same as they were before. They go back changed, and they go back with something um, that you know, the elixir, which could be a thing, a chalice or a thing. It could also be an idea, uh, something that changes. So if you imagine any, if you imagine the story of Muhammad or Buddha or Jesus or anything, you can think about how this framework works. Um, it should not surprise you that George Lucas was a student uh, and fan of Joseph Campbell and George Lucas wrote Star Wars to follow this um, exactly. In fact, the innermost cave is actually a cave, right, um, that uh, Luke Skywalker has his moments of doubt. Now, here's the thing. This is really, really powerful, but here's the thing that organizations get wrong um, is that they confuse who the hero is. They confuse who the hero is. So organizations often think the worst is that they think they're the hero. So they tell their story. Here's what we did. Here's all the great stuff we did. And they're the hero of their story. Sometimes they think that the beneficiary of their services are the hero of the story. And I think that makes sense in that, you know, there's a kid going through a terrible medical thing or there's, there's people who are going to um, have a school built or something, and, and a lot of what they go through feels heroic, and there's certainly important stories there to tell. But in this framework and in this context, that's not the hero either. Our hero is our donor. Our hero is our constituent. That's the hero. The organization is, oops, the, organization is the mentor. The organization is the one saying to the hero, you can change the world. You're not an ordinary person. I'm going to show you the way. Through us, through us as a vehicle, you're going to change the world 
through your donation, through your volunteering, through your action, through your talking about it, through your posting on Facebook. We're going to show you how you, an ordinary person, are not so ordinary. We're going to show you how you can make a difference. That little pivot, so you can take 90% of the same story that you want to tell about those people that you're helping, but put the role of the donor in the story somehow. Because if that donor is not empowered, if they don't see themselves, if they don't see the impact that they can have, then what's the point? Then it's just a good story. It's not a motivational story. It's not a story that matters. So I'm going to move on. I could certainly talk more about this. Um, and, uh, and if you have questions, you can, again, put them in the chat. So what we see is that the stories that really resonate with people, the stories that are emotional, are often the simple stories, and, and almost always the simple stories. And the simple stories meaning they're not too crowded with lots of different things, with program details, with all that stuff. It's about human emotions. It's about something that someone goes through. And again, you can put the hero in there, the donor, um, in a way where they're not taking 90% of your screen time, right? But they're just there in a key place that makes it clear that that impact, that thing that happened, that change in that person's life was not possible without that donor's action. It was not, it would not have happened. That the change, the, the catalyst for that change, the one that made that change happen is that donor. That's extremely empowering. And so, we, we have a question from Liz that, um, fits well with this topic. She asked, if you have more, if you have more than one story to tell, is it better to do two different three to four minute videos and show them separately at the event and then be able to use them separately in other cases? Um, or I guess the alternative would be combining those two stories into one. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. I think that sometimes those stories can fit really well together. You can tell, you can weave two stories together. It can be, you know, one story and then the other story. There could be that you're telling both at the same time. You know, we've made a lot of videos where you're you're telling one thread of the story and you then you cut to another thread and then they all both come sort of come together at the end. That can be really powerful. And then later on, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, is the idea of repurposing. These videos are really expensive. So the idea, if you could tell two stories and you could have a four to five minute gala event video that has both stories in it and then have two two minute videos or two two and a half minute videos or two one and a half minute videos that tell these individual stories, that's amazing because you've just gotten three products for the price of one and a quarter or one and a half, right? So, um, uh, so that, I think that's a great question, and I think the answer is it depends on the stories and whether they thematically fit together, whether you can kind of create that compelling narrative, how long it would take to tell those stories. Um, so I think, I think, yes, I think simple, it doesn't have to be one thing. It can be more than one thing, but I've never seen anybody oversimplify, right? So you, you always want to just lean toward that thing of saying, are we saying too much here? What would it look like if we only told this story? So just even the mental exercise of thinking that through can be very powerful. So this is, again, uh, you know, really critical and sometimes hard to hear for communications people or for organization people or for CEOs or, or, um, or executive directors. Nobody cares about organizations. They just don't. They, organizations are the vehicle for people to make change in the world. Your organizational life and existence exists for the change that you're trying to do. And when we, when we lose sight of that, we start to talk about the brand as a thing that matters. Um, and we lose sight of those stories and we lose sight of empowering the donor to be the agent of change. So, I think you know this is just a really core point that um, you know is that it's about the work, it's about the people, it's not about the brand, and the brand lives there. The brand, and you know the way I think you should think about it is that the brand should be the moon, and your your donor and your and the people that you're you're helping are the sun, and the moon doesn't make its own light at all right the moon only shines in the sky because of the reflected light of the sun and that's what your organizational brand needs to be it just is going to soak up that reflected light and people will notice it but when you stick it out front when you make it the sun 
that's when people turn off um, and aren't interested. So let's talk a little bit about making the most of your video investment because, and we started that, but you know, videos are expensive. Uh, and even if you're doing them in-house, just the time involved um, in a video is significant. So you really want to maximize that investment. And one thing we always think about at C3 is if I'm going to shoot an interview, if I'm going to get B-roll, if I'm going to do something, how many different ways can we use it? Because um, if we're just doing that event video, that's great. But if I can find multiple other uses, even if it costs just a little bit more to, to re-edit things, uh, I'm getting huge leverage out of that project. Uh, so we really think you go, you should go into these projects with that in mind and really thinking about, okay, how can these elements live um, in other places and for a longer period of time? So it's really about not reinventing the wheel, um, you know, in terms of going out and saying, well, every video we do, every piece of content has to be a unique piece of content. No, let's make, let's think about derivative materials. How can we um, create additional material from the same material we have? So an example of that is like Facebook videos. So these are just some examples of Facebook videos where today on Facebook with the autoplay, um, you um, are using a lot of B-roll and instead of sound, you're using uh, words on the screen, right? So people are watching these videos without ever turning the sound on. Well, you, in a, in a typical gala event video, you have a ton of stuff that could be converted and used in this way. So just as an example, um, you know, you could have snippets from interviews where you just put the words that they're saying on the screen as they're saying them and have the sound uh, if people want to turn it on. But you could, you know, again, you could cut that up and all of a sudden you have some really great content that you can use in social media, but also content for your YouTube channel, content for your website, different sections of your website. We once did a gala event video that looked at multiple organizational, told multiple stories, which all tracked to different programs that the organizational did. So there was three or four stories in the, in the gala event video, not just one, um, but each story was simple and, and emotional. And what we did afterwards was we, created an individual video out of each of those stories. And then those didn't live in a video section or just on YouTube. They lived in the program areas on the website for those programs. Because then this was a really powerful example of those programs living at the place that people are learning about those programs. And along the same lines, we have a question from Jim who asked, sure. Let's say our video is going to be used exclusively on the net, like on YouTube or Vimeo. If we are shooting video on DSLRs, there are various res resolution quality levels. Do you think it's okay to shoot in a lower level of resolution if you're just planning on sharing your video on the web? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too far into um, technical uh, production things, but generally um, you should shoot at the highest quality level that you can um, because you don't know how you're going to reuse and repurpose that video later. Um, and increasingly, you know, the screens are just getting better and better and better, um, even on, you know, on tablets and other things. You, so, I, so I think that, um, and bandwidth is increasing, so the, the ability to actually stream things that are of higher quality. So you don't know, I really, th we really believe in, you know, keeping archives of great footage that you can reuse and repurpose for long periods of time. Um, and so, you know, if that's the case, then why not shoot in a, in a higher quality? So, but, you know, j that said, your iPhone, if you have one, um, is incredible. I mean, shoots incredible video. We're seeing iPhone video showing up in feature films, right? So, so the, the, the technical thing is, is so, so much less of an issue. It's not an issue really. Um, I would say it's much more an issue about sound is, you know, how do you collect sound effectively? Because people will watch poor quality video with good sound. They will not watch great quality video with poor sound, right? So, so salt, making sure you do well on sound is really a key thing when people often just focus on, on the uh, images. So another, um, thing to really maximize the value of your video is, um, is uh, captions, uh, transcripts, and translation. So I want to talk about this for, for a minute. 
which is we have a, a partnership with DotSub, an incredible organization that created, that invented the way to um, make uh, captions uh, work easily on, on videos. And if you've seen um, on, on TED or, or, or on YouTube how that works, the way it works is that it's not burned in captions or transcripts. They're not um, in the video file itself, right? There, it's a it's a companion file, so you can upload a companion file in a certain format to YouTube um, that has an English transcript of your video, and it's time coded, so it goes along with that. So the user can turn on the captions and see um, a language there, see uh, a subtitle in English or in multiple languages. But here's the thing that's really critical. Once you upload that transcript in English, the content of your video becomes searchable and visible to search engines. Search engines can't are not searching your video. They're only looking at the metadata. They're only looking at the title, the tags, the things you add around your video. As soon as you put the transcript there in there, then you've exposed everything that's in that video to search engines. It's a huge benefit at a really low cost. So from the from an overall cost of your production, this is tiny. And we recommend and we've we're including this now in in video projects to do Spanish language captions for US based stuff because then it's showing up in Spanish language searches on the web as well. Again, really simple, really low cost thing that um, you know, makes your videos better, uh, more searchable, and more usable on the web. I'm happy to talk more about this uh, if anybody's interested uh, afterwards. So I'm just going to end here with a couple things. So I'm going to write a blog post about this, so you don't um, you don't have to run and take notes. And we're going to make the recording here available. But just some tips to leave you with here. Um, you know, one is about goals. So these are just reiterating a lot of things we talked about. Goals, you've got to sit down and just say, let's not talk about stories yet. Let's not plan the thing yet. Let's not whatever. What are we trying to do? What what does success look like? What do we want people to feel after they watch this video? What are our goals? And what role is a video playing in the event? And what role do we want to play after? Giving yourself time. I talked about that. Watching other videos. Again, do gooder. Uh, the Daily Do Gooder is a great place to do it. Um, uh, and if you just search for do gooder, you will find uh, our do gooder awards and do gooder programs, which also surface a lot of really great videos. So just watching the winners of the annual do gooder awards, which is something that um, C3 manages, um, is a great way to, to do that. Um, finding stories that matter. The donor is the hero. We talked about that. So um, program details. Do we really need to say this? That's a great question to ask during a process. Does, does anybody care about that detail? So keeping it simple telling less and more powerful stories. Um, simple is powerful. Um, checking back on your goals. You know, As you start to do a script, as you start to think about how this video is coming together, is it achieving those goals? If not, ask why not. Um, uh, thinking about that future use. You know, talked about that. If you're going to go shoot this interview, maybe you want to ask five additional questions that you're never going to use in the event video, but that you're there and you can capture and use in some other way. Maybe you want this person you're interviewing to do a thank you to some donors that then you can you can cut that off and in the post production you get a little thank you video out of it, right? For a fraction of what it would cost to shoot that as its own thing, right? So being really deliberate about it. And then finding the right production partner. I think, you know, this is obviously important. There's a lot of people who make nice video. There's not a lot of people who understand the donors, understand fundraising, understand the goals of your event. So really thinking about, you know, working with people who are going to help you with that. So not every video looks the same because it's not a cookie cutter thing. It's really that combination of connecting you uh, and your organization and your needs and your event needs with your goals and your audience and, and what you're trying to get them to do. So audience is really key, you know, an audience, uh, uh, you know, an audience of, if your audience is 70 year old women, it's going to be a different thing than if it's, you know, 40 to 50 year old women, right? Or if it's uh, uh, urban or, you know, so we 
uh, in all of our consulting, really, audience is really key and really understanding that audience. Um, and maybe it maybe it's your it it tracks to what your donor file looks like, or maybe it's a subset. But really thinking about um, you know who's in the room, what are the things that matter to them? How are we honoring their commitment? How are we showing people who are not as committed that this is a great place to be committed? When you lavish praise on those donors and you show how the donor's meaningful, if I'm not a donor and I'm in the room because I was invited by some donors, I think, wow, this is a group I want to be involved in, right? I want to be one of those people. There's an aspirational aspect to the community of how you treat those donors. So thinking about that as well. So, um, uh, you know, you can see some of the videos we've created, Kayla Event videos and others, um, at our at our YouTube channel. Um, and you can um, uh, uh, here's the link to that. Um, and then I'm gonna open it up to questions. So we have um, about 10 minutes or so um, left. And of course, just let me to close to say we're here to help. This is what we do. Um, we think about uh, the goals, the fundraising, the opportunity, and we have really uh, a strong uh, history and team uh, in creating and producing these videos. So Bridget, do we have uh, some questions? We have answered some of the questions that came in during the presentation. Um, oh, here we go. Please put up the YouTube channel URL again. Um, Jenna, I just sent it out in the chat. And Michael, could you go back on the slide? There you go. Yep. There you go. You got it there. Um, not seeing any other questions come up right now. So if you do have any questions, please send them um, now. Otherwise, we'll wrap up and give you all 10 minutes of your day back. Um, if you do have additional questions, you know, feel free to email Michael. Um, or you know, you're welcome to uh, chat with us via Twitter. I'm the person who manages our um, Twitter accounts. I'm always checking to see if we have stuff coming in. Um, so it's just at C3. That's um, how you'd like to communicate. Um, and I'm not. Um, yeah, so. Oh, here we go. Actually, um, I just had a bunch come in. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, great. Uh, so Adrian asks. Uh, what do you think about an award format for a video? How does that apply to the hero model being to the hero model being a donor? So the award format meaning that you're, you're awarding, you're giving an award at the event and you're using your video to talk about the person who's getting the award. I'm assuming that's what, that's what you mean by it. I think that's, that's, that's great. I mean, I've seen some really compelling videos, but you have to then not kind of phone it in about how you tell that story because I think the donor story, that hero's journey from the donor perspective can be really powerful. It's the person who says, I did really well in my career, you know, and but there was something missing. I ha had some opportunity um, and I really wanted to focus my attention on a place that could really make a difference. And here's how I got into that and here's what happened. Um, I have other people then telling us or showing the impact. Um, so that dive in away from that person and into the impact that they've, that they've had. And it's all sort of bookended by them being the one that made that possible. So I think that works. I mean, I think that you can, it's again, it's not a cookie cutter thing. There's lots of frameworks that can work here. Um, but thinking about emotional resonance, again, if I'm, if I feel like, oh, this is the rich guy and they're just kind of, you know, just showing him because whatever, and it's not interesting, then it's not going to be interesting, right? You still have to execute on, on that, even if that's the framework that you start from. All right, we have a question from Steve, which I know is something we hear a lot from our clients. Um, he says, some execs want to know the actual ROI of a video. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, on the one hand, you want to hold videos in general accountable for the return on investment. And on the other hand, um, you don't want to hold them more accountable than you hold other things. So, you know, when you have a gala event, you make a lot of choices that are, that require uh, investment. So the choice of venue, the choice of food, the choice of uh, speaker, if you're bringing in an external speaker, you know, all of those kinds of things, which the ROI is really wrapped up into the experience that people have in the event. Um, and so 
it's um, you know we talk about in advertising and in fundraising this idea of partial attribution you know that we can't uh, we can't assign all of the benefits of one thing it's really across multiple things and I think that just makes it a little bit challenging but uh, but I think it's important in general in the in the event context to say how did this event go did, did it do what we wanted it to do did it achieve its goals and then to talk to people about what why and what are the parts that they wanted to do so I definitely recommend we recommend surveys a lot like to talk to people who attended an event send out an email prepare in advance send it out right away after the event the next day saying you attended the event we're so happy that you came we'd love to make our events better and better could you answer some questions and have a really short poll that says you know which thing was the highlight and you list a bunch of things you know and then you go oh well 80% of the people said that the video was the highlight of the event well then you've got some data points there so I don't think there's a again a one-size-fits-all way to do that in the event Outside of the event, there's lots of ways to think about how video can have return on investment. So one thing is if you're using video in campaigns um, and you're tracking both the view throughs of those videos, the, the click throughs, uh, the you know how much people watch, how much people do take actions after watching videos. If you can make your gala event video into that video with a little bit of um, additional editing, you change the end card, you put it in a different place, um, then you can attribute all of those benefits back to that video in addition to whatever the video did in the in the gala event. So, you know, there are platforms that will let you connect people that landed on web pages through their email to how much they viewed the video or actions they've taken uh, after watching the video. So, I think, you know, we're we're all about uh, impact and metrics and testing um, it's not it's not as easy to test video or have or have impact metrics the way that you have them for example for email subject lines where there's essentially a zero cost to sending out you know three versions and seeing what happens you can't make three different videos and test them um, uh, or you can't do that in a practical you know way so it's a little bit more complicated and that's something that we've spent a lot of time you know helping organizations figure out um, so Terry asks, we are planning to do three 30-second to one-minute video at our event. So first of all, applause for Terry for doing such short videos. I think that's great. Um, and since that's so short, do we have any advice on making them compelling? Well, again, I think that, you know, it works both ways with the time. I think videos should be as long as they need to be. So when you say you're going to make 30-second videos, is that because you the content is built for 30 seconds? Well, so... You know, I, I sort of, I don't know the origins of that, maybe because you just have certain timing, um, but it's, it is a real skill to create 30 seconds that are powerful, but we know it's possible. We know it's possible from advertising, right? We've seen the advertising industry move to a more storytelling model. We see that the ad, you know, the Volkswagen ad with the kid dressed as Darth Vader and he's, you know, the, he's looks like he's controlling the car. Or, you know, there's lots of things that are, that are about product, but they're not really. They're just really good, compelling stories told in a very quick way. So it's definitely possible, but it's not possible with just a, a talking head. And I think it, it takes a real skill in the editing room. It takes real skill in figuring out which stories are going to work. Um, so I don't, I don't have like a single easy thing for you to do there. Just you're going to have to think it through a lot in advance before you actually shoot anything, before you before you do anything. And Sarah asks, how important is music? Does it manipulate the story or enhance it? Oh, we think music's really important. I think when you, um, often there's a bed of music in, in videos that you don't even notice as a casual viewer, but it's helping um, set the tone. And so that emotional thing that I talked about before is really connected to music. Music you know, can move you. Um, and so if you want certain emotions, if you're, if you're, you know, if you want people to be mad about some injustice, for example, the music should really support that at that moment. And then when you resolve something, the music should, should go there too. So we, we, we think music's really important. We often um, are able in a fairly affordable way to use um, composed music because you can then have music that's made to fit those things. Um, 
uh, and but you know I I definitely think music is an an important and usually a critical element, particularly in the gale event format, right? Um, so I, I would say you you do have to think about it. Okay, and then I have a uh, question from Liz here, and this might be our last question since I see we have about four minutes left. Um, so Liz asks, um, you know, we're we're searching for a partner. I'm, I'm summarizing a bit here. So she's searching for a partner for her, for her video, um, and or finding that video is a little more expensive than anticipated. Can you talk a little bit about what? Nonprofits should know about choosing video partners wisely while watching their budgets. And uh, she also asked yeah. here, is there a typical number you know, for, for a video um, for, for a gala video? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, in, in the videos that we make, you know, I would say range anywhere from, you know, $12,000 to $75,000. I mean, there's, and, and more, I mean, you know, if you're shooting in multiple places, if you're repur your plan is to repurpose things, if you're traveling to multiple locations or even internationally, obviously those are big things. But we've made a lot of powerful videos with 100% existing content, except for, let's say, the voiceover that's recorded. So using great photography that you already have, using video footage that was captured elsewhere, um, and, and, and putting something together. So I think it's really the skill, paying for the skills of crafting that, of thinking it through, of doing the strategy is as important as, you know, where you can burn a lot of costs would be interviews with four people in four different locations. Well, there you just, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to do that right. Um, but maybe you didn't need to do that, right? Maybe you could, you could figure out a way to use existing assets in some way to make it work. So I would say, I would definitely encourage you to call us because, you know, the first thing we will say to somebody is, hey, don't use us for this. Here's how you should do this, or you should do this in-house. So we're not interested at all in working with people where we can't do way better than anybody else that you would talk to, and we'll tell you that, and we'll tell you, you know, exactly uh, that, totally, 100% above board. So um, so I think that, you know, talking this to folks, talking to us, saying, okay, look, this is really the money we put aside. We only put aside, we put aside $10,000. That's a lot for us. You know, what can we do for that? Um, would it matter if we could stretch a little bit to, act, you know, to this or this? Would it really make a difference? Like, I think talking through those things is, is worthwhile, and, you know, we would be happy to talk through those things with you. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to wrap it up there. We have a couple more. Um, there's maybe one more question, but I think we can follow up with that person via email. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and I look out for the next webinar, the recording from this webinar and the slides will be sent out in an email, um, hopefully later today, if not, uh, definitely by next Monday. Um, and again, thank you for being here. Thank you all really, uh, appreciate it. And again, feel free to reach out to us and thank you, Bridget, for, for managing all this and we'll, we'll hopefully be in touch. All right. Have a great day and a great weekend.